Alexis. You can find me on the web as Ultrabug. Um, I'm a Gen2 Linux developer and I've been part of, of uh, the Python team, the cluster team, and I maintain various packages related to NoSQL, key value stores such as Redis and message queuing uh, technologies. Um, in my professional life, I am a CTO at a, a company named Numberly, uh, where we do programmatic and data-driven marketing and advertising for our clients. Today, well, I'm gonna talk to you um, about designing a scalable and distributed application. Um, as you may have seen this year, we have a, quite a lot of uh, DevOps talk um, at EuroPython, which is actually a good thing, and this is actually one of them. Um, I will not show a lot of Python code uh, on the slides themselves. Instead, I will demonstrate a full stack for running distributed Python uh, at scale. Um, just as a disclaimer, there is no definitive way of doing uh, this kind of thing. Um, so I will just share my experience and give some guidelines uh, that I found interesting um, to address this kind of design. And I will do something very perilous uh, as to showcase a real application in a live demo. That's what I promised, so I'll try, I'll try my best to keep this up. Um, so what are we gonna do? We are gonna design a geo-distributed page hit counter web application. Um, and now I'm gonna just explain quickly what are the steps we will follow for this? Uh, I will start by explaining to you and agreeing with you about the application's contract, which defines the goals and functionalities we expect our application to do. Then I will continue on um, with some philosophical guidelines that I used to design this application. Then I will present the stack I chose and explain why and then we'll talk about service discovery, and then we, we will implement service discovery in our application, and we'll end up with the live demo, and then maybe an open discussion. So let's start with the first point of our um, contract. Geo-distributed means multi-data center. Um, we expect our application to provide the same level of functionality around the world. This, uh, in this talk, I will not cover how you do GeoDNS to direct your users to the closest data center, uh, but instead I will focus on the application itself. The second point of uh, our application's contract is that uh, the web application will display the sum of the page hits from all our data centers around the world. Um, the counter displayed should be the same to all users wherever they come from. The third point of our uh, contract is that uh, scaling out or down our application should take no manual operation uh, or reconfiguration on the application side, um, even when we add a whole data center to uh, our application. And that means then that our application will be able to grow or shrink itself automatically, and this will obviously provide some kind of fault tolerance. The last point of our applications contract is uh, that we will have the background color of uh, the web service um, configurable. And when changing this configuration, it should be made available uh, to all the web services uh, immediately in all the data centers. So we configure it once and it's deployed and taken into account immediately everywhere. Okay, um, that's some um, kind of contract. And what I think is that solving this kind of complicated problems uh, usually depends more on pragmatic techn technological choices uh, rather than pure coding skills. Um, let me share first some guidelines I found interesting over the time uh, to address this kind of issue. The first one is actually that your stack is what makes your code run and what makes your application accessible. So for this matter, I really favor using um, and choosing tools offering a maximum of features that developers and operation guys 
can both benefit from. That's an important point. And this, is a, this will allow all the involved parties to use and uh, reuse robust functionalities uh, instead of having to re implement or code them uh, over and over. The second point you may all know, actually, um, is the, that the Zen of Python, I think, is a good uh, philosophy that can help you choose the right technologies and implementations for uh, your architecture. I usually, and more, uh, the more that I can, avoid using any black box or magical technologies. Um, this means usually that um, I tend to avoid technologies that I wouldn't be able to explain to my mom or dad in less than five minutes. The other one is that um, there is a good story that you may already all know, is that one day there were those guys who had to build a tool to manipulate text files. And they could have done one big program that could do everything on its own with a lot of options and stuff like that. Instead, they created tools like CAT, GREP, or SED, which specialize in special tasks of file manipulation. And then they created pipes. So we could combine them all, et voila. Well, this proved to be a great design over the years, I guess, um, and we can absolutely apply this kind of design to distributed application. This ended up into breaking things uh, and our application down into small components. Each component will provide a small and simple service. Isolation also means that this component should be really autonomous um, so we really have to resist uh, the temptation of sharing any kind of state between them. You can relate this to REST APIs, which are a good example as um, we, because we, do, we use them and reuse them in our own applications um, and they can be seen as isolated components from our application. But now, how big can a component be, really? Well, that's when you start thinking microservices, right? That's the trendy world of today. Um, and it's getting more and more popular, and it's a good thing, but actually microservices are nothing new. It's just the extreme version of component isolation. And it is by a sense a distributed uh, architecture style and actually suffers from the same trade-offs. And one more, which is that when you talk about microservices, you talk about micromanagement. You have to work hard on automation and this can take time. So I recommend finding a good balance between your needs and the added orchestration complexity that is implies. You have to ask yourself, do I really need to split this up? Because then the more you split your components, the more you rely on their ability to communicate with each other. And this is true for every distributed architecture and every uh, distributed design, actually. Remote communication is slower and can be unreliable um, in case of network failure or latency, which you cannot control. Um, this gets even worse when you start using um, internet, internet sorry, to connect your components together. I find that message or job queuing technologies are a good choice to address uh, these kind of issues uh, because they provide by themselves some kind of network fault tolerance uh, mechanisms. Um, but what when our components can still not communicate with each other? That's when our application can become eventually consistent. I think that this is a major point because this has a great impact on how you design your application. We have to decide where we can accept that kind of state in our code or architecture and make compromises. So now, let's talk about our application stack. Okay, in my case, I chose Nginx and Uwuzgi. I chose Nginx because it's, re it's very fast and offers a lot of interesting features at the HTTP level. We will use it as the main entrance of our web services. Uwuzgi, on the other hand, is a fast and pluggable application server. 
it will run our code. It's written in C++ and was designed from the start with Python as its primary language support, but it does not only support Python. It offers on, on the fly some uh, strong and proven features which we can use natively with Python as well, such as async loops for Gevent, async IO, virtual env, on, on this pooling and metrics support. And what's good about them is that they integrate with Sheet Server easily. There are uh, configuration options in uh, Nginx to speak with USG. So now let's review our applications components. The first one is what we will call and agree to call the collector. The collector uh, gets one HTTP request and for each HTTP request, we generate a hit job for our backend processor. We will query the total hit count, which we will display back to the user. It's pretty straightforward on paper. Then we have the processor. The processor consumes jobs and increments a counter for each jobs it consumes. There again, it's pretty straightforward. But now let's see how we can use the stack for those components. We end up with having the collector uh, component on the left. This actually represents a whole server and the processor runs on its own server as well. So there is a clear separation of them. Nginx is at the front uh, of um, our collector web service and it passes down the requests through USG down to our code, which is in this case uh, written in Flask and using a synchronous loop of uh, Gevent. The processor component uh, is the backend responsible for calculating the total hit sum. USG is running this simple Python code as a mule, that's the USG term, but you can see it as a sort of daemon. So that's just pure Python execution, nothing else. Now, we have these two separated components running on each server and we need a tool to exchange jobs between them. That's what Binstall D was exactly designed to do in a blazing fast and reliable way. I chose Binstall D over other uh, queuing technologies such as ZeroMQ or RabbitMQ um, because its core design is just like Mem Memcached for the one of you who already tried it. And it just, that means that it just does one thing and do it simple and fast. It is that simple to set up very easy to operate, there's almost nothing to configure, and it offers persistence for fault tolerance. Spawning it using USG and more into our binstalled D in case of a sudden crash, and so USG responds the binstalled D server on the fly for us, is really simple in binstalled D. It's just the actual command that you would run on your terminal. But now the last question is here, where do I run this Binstall D service? Do I split it on its own server, the microservices way, or uh, do I include it within one of our components? And if so, which one? Well, in this case, I want to make sure that I never lose any hit count. That means that I need a strong locality between the collector and Binstall D. I don't, need, I don't want to have communication problems between them. So I bundle them in the same server, in the same component. I accept the compromise that comes with this is that my processor um, can become eventually consistent in case of a network failure here in between. In case the processor can't get the job from install D, then my counter will not be incremented. That means my application becomes eventually consistent. Now, let's see how this scales out in one data center. Duplicating collectors have an impact on the processors. Every time I had a collector, I need to reconfigure, for now by hand, uh, each of my processor or one processor so that it connects to every Binstall D instances from all the collectors and pulls jobs from them. Duplicating our processors 
means that we need some kind of external database around here uh, so they can share a single counter. The two processors here, that you can see, they increment the data center counter for each job they get, they get but together in parallel. Then the collector can access this same counter and display it to the user. How does it work if I start spanning this over multiple data centers? Well, we can actually keep one counter, one local counter per data center, then the collectors would need the way to access the count from all the data centers. Then they can sum the two counters, in this case that would be 500, and display the result to the user. We need a system that will allow our components to detect each other's automatically. That is what discovery is for. You can see service discovery as a sort of dynamic implementation of DNS. With DNS, you request a domain name, you get a server IP, whether it's up or down, and your browser connects to it. Service discovery, on the other hand, is dynamic. That means that you query a catalog for a given service and you get a list of all the available hosts providing the service. If one of those hosts becomes unavailable in case of a shutdown, standard shutdown or failure, it is removed from the catalog immediately and your application stops connecting to it. That's as simple as that. There are a few service discovery uh, servers available providing different kind of features um, such as Zookeeper, ETCD, and Console. Console, once again, I chose Console because it provides all the features I need to address the limitations we just talked about. It is written in Go and it is very easy to use and deploy. There are several um, Python libraries to use console. Uh, in our demo, I use consulate for this application. Um, so now let's take a, a dive into console and see how it works. On each data center, we have a console cluster, which is usually um, made of three console servers. One of them is the local data centers console leader. Each console cluster offers um, a counter key value store. I said counter, but it's a just a local key value store. You can put anything in it. And then you use agents here um, to interact with the console cluster. That means that your services will register and deregister themselves through the console um, agents. That means also that your clients will be able to look up for a service and in the catalog or query the key value store um, using the agent in the console cluster. The console cluster can also be queried using standard DNS or an HTTP API if you want to do it yourself. Finally, we connect different console clusters from, um, from each other using the one gossip protocol through internet here. This is a simple configuration that you add on each console cluster so they know where to connect to and then they join and communicate with each other natively. There is one great thing about uh, console and Uwuzgi is that there is a plugin uh, integration of uh, console into Uwuzgi it will allow uh, then to automatically register your application in the cluster when it started successfully. Then USG will handle for you the, thing, the health checking, so that it will send periodically health checks saying, hey, the application is still alive, you can keep it on the catalog, and you keep the catalog fresh, and we will do it for you, so you don't have to code it yourself. Then again, your stack will help you. Um, and if our application happens to fail, or even if USG as a whole fails, then uh, the service uh, will be removed from the console cluster automatically. It is very easy to use. It's just one line you had in the um, USG file I showed you earlier. Um, there's nothing pretty much around here much to say. 
okay, so we have all those bricks together and we are finally ready to put all the pieces around. So let's build this up. We had a collector and a processor components. Then we added communication between them using Binstall D. Then we added a counter, a central counter, and we could then start um, scaling out our collectors and scaling out our processors. Then we used the key value store from the console cluster to handle these, um, the, the counter for us, and we used service discovery to allow our processors to detect every install D in services in our topology and get jobs from them. And then, now we can add another data center in our topology, connect the two cl console clusters together through internet, and voila. All our components are aware of the presence of the two data centers, and we're done. There was one last note before the demo, is that our collectors should be doing the sum of each data center's counter, but how? How do you implement this kind of thing? If they can connect to every available data center and query the counter there, the counter there, so that means those collectors will connect to this console cluster and get the 100 counter, then it will auto detect that there is another data center, connect to it through internet and get the counter over there, make the sum. What happens if there is an internet problem? A communication problem between our data centers. That doesn't scale right. So instead, each time a processor will increment its local counter here, so each, each time it does plus one, it will itself detect that there is another data center available on our topology, connect to it, and add its own value of the US counter and here on the Europe counter in the key value store of the opposite data center. So that now when count collectors need to get the list and the sum of all the counters from all data centers, they can just query the local counter for their console cluster. That's all. That's locality and we avoid any kind of problem or inconsistency between our um, for our web application. And at the end of the live demo, I will showcase an internet problem so you will be able to actually see it happen. Wow, okay, I don't know you, but I think kind of relaxed now, but that sounds like mind blowing, you know? Okay, so here I take the big risk of, the, of uh, today and we go for a live demo. Let's go. So, we'll start um, by going, so on the right side you have the European stuff. On the left side you will have the US stuff. I will start by showing you the console UI which comes directly with the with console. So we start with, the, with this um, in the European data center, EU West, and we will have US West. For now, it's, uh, it's down for, on purpose. Um, we only see the console leader, which is available. There is only one node, which is himself. And there is no key value storage. Yeah, there is anything in our key value store. Fine. So, um, That I forgot to prepare. That's the stress. Okay, this is the console log. All right. So now I will start by um, I will start a collector, right? So I'm getting my um, web service up. What you can see here is that USG already um, detected my collector and registered it on console for me. 
we can see now that in the services, I indeed have a collector and a binstall service available on my cluster. There is a new node that appeared, but the key value store is still zero. I will now load my uh, web service. OK, so it responded correctly, and the sum is for now zero. I just did one hit. I do two hits, three, four, five. What's happening? Well, I still don't have a processor service available. So for now, my collector is just putting hit jobs in my binstall D server. But they are staying there. They need to be pulled from there and processed by my process service. So they are inserted in the key value store, which will then be displayed over here. OK, so let's do it. I'm going to connect to um, the processor now and start my processor service. OK, so my processor service uh, started, right? And what we can see, OK, there are some people who actually connected to the service, <laughs> yeah? Because we have nine jobs around here. OK, so, well, um, yeah, I, I should have. OK, well, anyway. Um, <laughs> so my processor service started in the EU West uh, data center. And that's what you can see here. Once again, USG registered it on, um, on, uh, on the console cluster. And then it allowed our uh, processor to detect that there was one BeanStore D service available in this data center. And it connected to it, which is, this is the machine, uh, the collector machine. It discovered that there was nine jobs on it. And then it went and it incremented a count slash US, EU West, sorry, um, uh, equals nine, which are the number of, that, of the, the, the hits that we had at this time. Now I think, yeah, OK. There are some guys who are just hammering it. Anyway, it's a good. <laughs> it's, it's perfect. It's perfect, truly. Really. So you can see here that, <laughs> yeah, all right. This is not a talk about load testing, guys. <laughs> all right, it's OK. So yeah, actually, if I reload now my <laughs> application here and uh, web service, I can see that it discovered that there is actually uh, the EU West data center available and that the hit count was, at the time, 247 and the sum of 247 plus himself is just 247. Uh, I can still see now that in my services, in um, uh, the processor is here and working as expected. There is three nodes, our three nodes now. And in the key value, indeed, I have a count and EU West, which is now 273. OK. So this is working as expected. And right. Just for the audience, if you could try not too much hammering, because now I'm going to start a new uh, collector service. And what's usually interesting to see is that as soon as I will start it, um, it will be picked up on the processor, and the processor will say, hey, now there are two Beanstalk DN services available, and I will start playing with them too. No, you don't want to stop? All right. OK, we'll try. Thank you. And no, OK. <laughs> you see that immediately uh, our processor uh, uh, our processor picked the, the new one and said that, OK, now I have two bin study service. And now the load is distributed between my collectors, and voila. So it scales out really easily. I can see still that in my um, console cluster, now I have four nodes up, and that the key value keeps on growing, right? OK, I promised another thing in my contract is that the background of my, so I will do it myself and restart this every second. OK. <laughs> I win. Um, I will start <laughs> setting the color of my, in my EU West data center to green. OK. And this will actually put a job on the Beanstalk D from the collector. And, and then it will be picked up by the processor, which will, in turn, 
detect all the data centers available and set the right color on the key value, which is in turn picked up by the collector uh, web service and displayed to the user. So this is what just happened before your eyes. Um, indeed, in the key value now, I can see that the color is green. Okay. So this seems to work, actually, um, which is pretty amazing. No. And I can change it whenever I want, and it's immediately picked up by uh, our um, web services, whatever they are. Okay, this was fun on one data center. Now, how does it work on, the, on another data center? So here, this is the council leader logs, okay, on, the, on Europe. So I will start by um, adding the, a new council cluster in the US now. Okay, they picked up each other, so now you can see that in Europe, they see that there is a US West DC available, and you can see in that the US that they picked up a EU West DC available. Fine. In this time, I will start by um, starting my processor in the US first. Okay, what happened here is that I implemented some kind of synchronization, initialization uh, of my US cluster, uh, console cluster. And when uh, the um, processor started, it got registered as usual by USG for me in, uh, in the, in the U e US sorry, um, data center. And then it picked up that there is one European uh, data center available. So it went there and discovered that there was a key value named color with the value purple and it synchronized it on the US soil. Then it did the same thing for, it, for the counter available in the US, which was at the time 1082. And finally, um, it said that there is no bin storage service available in the US yet. This is normal and expected. We didn't start any collector on the US yes, yet. So let's connect to the US uh, console cluster. Uh, we can see that we only have one other service than the console leader, which is the processor we just started. There are two nodes. And in the key value store, I have the configured purple available, and I already have the EU West um, counter here, and I initialize the U US West to zero. Okay, so what you can see, actually, if I keep on changing here, is that it's growing. Yes, because the processor on the European side picked up that there was uh, the US data center available. So now it's not only copying its own counter to Europe, but it's also copying it to uh, US. Okay, but still, I still don't have a web service available in the US, so that's what I'm gonna do now. And here, what do you expect? Okay. Well, here we expect <laughs> that um, our application will start, really, and then, oh, you'll see by yourself. Look at this. Nothing. Okay, for now it's normal because we didn't have any hit count made uh, from the US side. So I will just start querying my US web service, which just appeared in Europe as soon as the counter got incremented in the US. And now you can see that they are pretty much doing what our applications contract was for, which is display the sum of the, total of the, of the hit count from every data center. And I can still play a bit with my um, color thing and change the color and it gets picked up everywhere around the world.
not finished. It's not finished. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Just, just to finish up, uh, I promise that I will cut loose the two, uh, the two, um, yeah, I'm, I'm good on schedule. And I'm going to cut loose the, and cut the um, communication between the two data, data centers, and you will hopefully understand why this copying of the counter is efficient to, um, to address uh, inconsistency problems. So here, I just stop the console server on the US. OK. So now, in the US, indeed, the sum is 0. I can't query uh, the local key value store, which is dependent on the key console cluster. But what you can see here is that my sum hit count still remains consistent. And that is because this counter was synchronized from the US to the U European console key value store. That was the point I was trying to make earlier. Maybe I was not very clear about it, but now you can see it live. And then I can just start again my uh, console um, cluster on the US part and everything gets picked up, picked up uh, once again. The, the USG uh, here, USG will, uh, will reconnect to, uh, to uh, the cluster by itself and start doing the job as usual. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, this source code is available on GitHub, so I encourage you to check it out. Uh, maybe now that we have some time ahead of us, we can discuss this. Uh, it's not about no question. Like I said, it's um, an open discussion because this is the way I happen to implement it, but I'm sure that you may have implemented it maybe other ways. Um, you can, oh yeah, there is one good thing about the source code is, is it is not just about source code. It, I also provided all the Ansible playbooks to actually orchestrate and automate the installation of all the stack you just uh, seen. Um, so you can play with it. I did it on Amazon Web Services, so I guess it's the common standard for the most people, um, but you can, Definitely adapt it to containers or whatever you want. It's not a problem at all. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you very much uh, for this awesome talk. I have a question. Um, was there any reason not to use Redis? for the key value store, because it provides a lot of uh, rich functionality working with values. Thanks. Yeah. That would have meant another component in my topology, which I really didn't need for this kind of application. So it really depends on what you are designing, actually. But in this case, all I needed, all I needed is a key value store, and I could just very easily implement the replication of it thanks to um, service discovery offered also by console. So with only one technology, I could address everything at once. So I didn't really need some kind of added complexity or uh, features from Redis to achieve anything else from here. But yeah, you could definitely use it for your own needs and use it. Any questions? Thanks again, wonderful talk. And the UI is nice. I mean, tile manager and stuff, cool. So mm, let me imagine a case when I have, let's say, a similar topology, but a bit different task. For example, I implement a computer game, so I have two tanks that can, I don't know, fire a bullet, right? That client can fire a bullet, another client can fire a bullet, so like a game. And um, I face, the transport problem, so transport mm. can lag. And I have to calculate somehow both on a client and a server, perhaps what uh, you suggest 
easier to calculate latency and somehow adapt on a client or put more logic to the server if he has and how. Thanks. That's a tricky question, uh, which is about latency management. Well, um, if, there, if, if you need 400 milliseconds to go from one part of the world to the other, whether you implement this on a server, on a client or a server is almost the same. The advantage you have on the client side is that usually you use GeoDNS to make sure that your user is close to the data center serving your game. So in this case, I will try as much as I can to mitigate this and put some logic also on the client side. But if the user from the US fired first, uh, some from Europe fired, whatever you do on the client side in the US side, it will take 400 milliseconds for this information to reach the other server. So maybe you are looking for peer-to-peer -peer type of connections instead of uh, having um, a star technology, uh, a star topology, you know. Maybe I will try in this kind of field for your, for your example. Thank you, Svetal. Uh, I want to add some points about gaming. Gaming is a better ex ex example for this talk because uh, uh, in gaming you should implement all feature on the server because a client can be broken and you uh, should work with this idea. <laughs> so uh, in this case, uh, the better way is to implement some uh, logic on the server. Thanks. Yeah. If you, there is no definitive way. WebSockets are also a good thing to use event-based uh, interactions, so you can benefit also from the client side to handle these kind of things. If you were in uh, 2013, uh, EuroPython, there was a very good uh, demonstration of uh, a game which was not distributed, but with the client side and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Python side using Ubusgi, and by the creator of Ubusgi, Roberto, um, so I, maybe you should check it out just to see just how he, he played with the server part and the, the, the front part. But yeah, it's even, even based on, 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 the, on, the, on the front. And you have, just to finish on games, actually, when you see MMO, uh, MMOs uh, games such as EVE Online that I played a lot at the time, uh, there is no miracle solution, all the clients connect to one and only one data center. That's, that's the point. So yeah, there is no big miracle anyway. So you can mitigate, but not fulfill fully. Sorry. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you for the talk. I have a question. What happens if, uh, this case is a simple one, it's a counter, but what happens if we have something bigger to process and one of the processors dies? Let's say it's the only different machine. Yeah. So basically, we would have an inconsistent state, and how would you address that? Okay. And so the failure of a processor, while it is processing a job, which can be, which can take, which can take time. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, it's already implemented in Beanstall D. You have this um, reserve and uh, delete mechanism. So that's an acknowledgement protocol. That means that when you take a job, you reserve it, and you have, per, per default, um, two minutes to process it before BinstallD puts it back in the queue. So if your process dies in between those two minutes, and that's configurable, you can choose, uh, well, then it will re-enter the queue and be pulled by another live processor and be processed in the end. So that's persistence, and the delay between them is the, the, the time to leave. You, you, in uh, in Binso, this time it's called time to run, uh, value you put, that's all. Yeah, and what about um, if we have something critical and we need to have a consistent state across data centers maybe? Mm -hmm. How can we do that? Let's say we have, I don't know, something very important to count. 
and when someone uh, checks that counter, it has to be accurate. At 100 percent? Then um, nothing. It's 100. It's no, no. It's a simple. Goal, it's goal. a simple answer. Then you cannot split the collector part and the processor part. You have to make them to stick together in the same component, in the same in the same server, and in the same serv uh, component. Duplicate this component over multiple data centers, and then have them be aware of all the data centers available. And you just have to do everything at once. That's all. You don't need Beanstalk D, actually, almost. Yeah, you don't need it at all. Yeah, OK. Yeah? Thank you. Beanstalk D is indeed here for the asynchronicity in our case. Yeah, OK. But it's still doable. Service discovery will allow you to do it easily. I'm just wondering um, what your experience is with uh, using this kind of thing for uh, somewhat unreliable things. So the, the main thing that I'm thinking here is um, for sending out emails. You know, I have a queue of emails to send out or something like that. And so when you know when your process is handling something that you're going too fast for me, Sarah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> if um, if your processor is handling a job that is unreliable, like sending an email mm -hmm. or an SMS, um, uh, how do how do you handle that? How do you handle that resiliently and, and effectively? Well, I think it's the same than before. Um, if you have to see a job like a representation of, maybe you, some of you use salary, uh, so it's a task, actually. You can see it as a task. It's just like the same thing. So I, the difference here is that implemented it by myself. I didn't need an, an, an extra library which comes with other dependencies, in this case, would be a RabbitMQ. So if my job in BeanStoreD represents an email and that my processor once again fails between, uh, before it uh, happened to send it efficiently and effectively, sorry, um, then it will re-enter the, the same queue and it will be picked up by another processor, which will try in turn. Does that answer your question? Sure, if I can add on to it then maybe a little bit, which is, you know, so in the case of an email, you send it out, your process is like, yes, I send my email, that's awesome. And then, you know, seven hours later, it comes back as bounced. Ah. And so you're, you're in that thing of trying to link, uh, link your jobs back together. Yeah, yeah. You will have to implement some kind of um, bounce parser. So depending on your MTA, it may be something e fairly easily to do or not. And then detect this kind of event. And I guess you would need a sort of database between them to store uh, all the data you, or the HTML or the, the source of your email that you were sending and just process, generate another job from it uh, to, to, to redo it. But Usually, well, we do a lot of emails in uh, our company, so this is, you, you shouldn't do this kind of thing, actually, in, uh, in real life. Detect a bounce and try to resend the same email to the same address uh, would be considered as abuse by most um, email service providers. But yeah, you could end up with something like this, maybe. Hi, um, let's assume one of your data center is DDoS by someone. Hmm. You don't have the ability to uh, spread the computation across many data center, right? Yes, you can. If you are DDoS in US, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. uh, only US processor will compute the addition for US incoming it. Yep. How you can cross that or spread that over the world or uh, I don't know, anywhere well, to, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I guess I, know, I see what you mean. There are two problems with DDoS. The first one is that it kills your internet connection. So you end up like when I stopped the um, console leader on the US part. That's a sort of brain split, right? So it's, you can compare it to a network failure. So 
if you have a network failure such as this, your hit counts and your regular users' requests don't come in, right? So there's nothing much to process anyway, no? I don't know. But every, the, 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 the communication is, between yeah. the processors and the collectors is lo it's a local one. It's you, on a VPC, can. right? So this won't be affected at all. But you, need, you still need to get... You, you can have your USQ full of messages and no. your... Ah, okay, okay, okay. Your ye, Sorry. U yeah. EQ okay. quite normally Cool. Yeah, yeah, that, that's possible. Then you have to do some kind of auto-scaling load uh, or um, filtering or, uh, well, rate control. But, but you can't, every, you can't every step ask you can the do. Uh, processor to process the US being stored D. Yeah, yeah, you could, you could, you could. The first implementation actually that I did, I did like this, like you said, the processors were getting jobs from all the bin all around the data, uh, all around the data centers. But then you still face the problem then when you are DDoS, the processors from Europe wouldn't anyway be able to communicate with the US bin Ds so well. And I found it too a bit more complex to explain. So I, I ended up with this one, this topology, which I think was, I hope, <laughs> easier to understand. Thanks. And demonstrate. Have more questions, comments? Or discussion? <laughs> Suggestions? Uh, as I don't know, Consul, uh, which is the size of the data it can maintain? In the key value store? Yeah. Uh, I don't remember the actual <laughs> maximum size of a key. Uh, of the value associated to a key, but it's a couple of megs. Overall, depends. Oh, oh, the, the size of the console database, not of the single field. Okay. This question. Thank you, yeah, you know, I, I try to answer. Sure. Um, uh, it's a better idea to keep in the console uh, 100 megabytes. I know people that try to keep in console maybe uh, 500 megabytes, and it will be, uh, it was a big problem to synchronize it between all again, again um, agents of console. So console is a uh, key value storage for the small count of data. Yeah, it's meant for configuration mostly. It's configuration distribution mostly, yeah. and availability. Main problem in the cap, cap theorem, you know, uh, capability, um, con consistently, availability, and persistent. Hmm. You can choose only two or three. <laughs> yeah. Then you would need some kind of um, cross data center. Uh, you, you would need a, a database that have XDR, cross data center replication support, and use this one, I guess. That would be the perfect... Uh, that's still a problem. Yeah, yeah, I know. But we are bound to internet uh, speed, so yeah, that's that's the point. But it works in real life. So there are a lot of people using uh, data center replication uh, of databases, and there are quite a nice databases that uh, have some pretty nice and neat implementations of. Uh, of this, uh, I think one of the most uh, mature one about this in real production and very, very high load is Aerospike. If you ever heard of, it, of them, it's, um, it, they are good at this, really good at this, and been doing in big uh, situation uh, and a very high workload for years now. So maybe you check it out. Sorry. Okay, thanks for the talk. Um, uh, I have a question. How uh, console server will realize that some process will die if process will die? You have a timeout between health checks. Uh huh. So it sounds so hard. If it doesn't hear back from, it's a, yeah, it's herbit based. Though if it doesn't hear back, it re, it's removed from the catalog. Okay. 
So if a uh, collector is my Python process, how exactly heartbeat sending is implemented? Once again? Well, I'm just wondering from architecture perspective, uh, your collector process is implemented in Python, right? Yeah, everything's implemented in Python. So um, you have some kind of thread which is sending heartbeats? No, I use a USG uh, console plugin which does it all for me. Actually, the HTTP worker source code it looks like this. Uh, I just connect to console to get uh, the count, every, every key under my count uh, folder. You can see, right? Uh, I can change. Sorry. There is lights. lights. Mm -hmm. It's better? All right. Um, so get data from console, gets the color and with a default value and finds every uh, uh, key under the count folder in the key value store and then sums, it up, sums them up. So in my collector, all I have to do is connect to console, nothing else. The health check, the service registration or deregistration is done by the um, USG console plugin for me. That was one line I added on the, on the collector initialization file for USG. Then USG spawned this code ran it and registered, and when it was sure it was up, it registered it on the console cluster catalog and then it became available. Okay, how USG is doing this in Using internally? the console cluster HTTP API uh -huh. and pulling on it. You can check also the source code yeah, of the console you. plugin uh, which is written in C++ and it's, it's really easy but you don't have to code it yourself. Your stack is here for you, and that's good. Okay, we're almost time for coffee, so if we can have discussion after this, it would be great. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.